Welcome to Sunspots, where we highlight the many ministries and missions happening on the surface of the sun, that is, the Senate of the Sun. A region of the Presbyterian Church, USA, we are Presbyterians in Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas, with dynamic and hopeful ministry happening in the name of Jesus Christ. Sunspots are caused by interactions with the Holy Spirit, somewhat like the cap on a soda bottle. Shake it up and you can generate a big eruption. Happening throughout the 11 presbyteries in the Synod with the intense Holy Spirit activity. When the energy is released, solar flares and big impact can erupt from sunspots. Our prayer is that you find inspiration, community, and connection in the sun. Welcome to this edition of Sunspots. Let's get started. And now, here's your host, Synod leader and stated clerk, Valerie Young. This podcast contains some references to the realities of what can happen when a church opens itself up to taking care of poor and marginalized communities. While language about prostitution, drug use, domestic violence, and medical issues are not normally part of our podcast, the description of this kind of work and ministry can be jarring. Some parts of this podcast may not be suitable for younger audiences. Hi, everyone. My name is Valerie Young, and I am the Synod Leader and Stated Clerk for the Synod of the Sun. With me today is the Reverend Dr. Timothy Davenport Herbst. Tim is a seventh generation Michigan, Michigander. Is that how you say that, Tim? Michigander. Michigander, okay, who moved to the great state of Texas a quarter century ago, shortly after marrying an eighth generation Texan. You just couldn't get out of moving to Texas with that. Um, Yeah. Um, Tim and Cynthia met at Louisville Seminary and have almost finished raising three kids. You're never fully finished, by the way. Um, Tim received his doctorate in mission from the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. All of his pastorates have been in Texas, from the Rio Grande to the Metroplex and Northeast Texas, and now at St. Paul Presbyterian Church in San Angelo, Texas, for 13 years next March. St. Paul Presbyterian Church has been deeply involved in community ministry for decades, starting the homeless programs, the first 12-step and drug treatment programs in the Concho Valley, resettling four waves of refugees, and feeding the community for more than 30 years. Welcome, Tim. I'm so glad you could be with me today. Thank you, Valerie. I so appreciate the opportunity to do this. I'm looking um, forward- So I want to talk to you about St. Paul Presbyterian Church in San Angelo. This congregation just watching from the outside has been inspiring. So can you give us a brief history and some demographics of the congregation? Sure. So we actually have three start dates and people argue about them when they get into it anywhere from 1881 to 1896. Uh, We were a Cumberland church that ended up joining in with most Cumberland churches that rejoined the Presbyterian Church USA in 1906. And from a very early time on, the tradition of the church was to have a pastor that would push it to do more than it had ever done before. And by the 50s, this was manifested in uh, the very first Alcoholics Anonymous. At that point, our pastor would go into bars and meet people, and this was just absolutely scandalous. You know, now I can hold a Bible study in a bar, but back then it was progressive beyond what people were accustomed to. And since that time, we've started up Habitat for Humanity, um, Sexual Victim Services, um, the Palmer Drug Abuse Program, uh, Community Pantry, and about 30 years ago, we started doing a huge Christmas food program. One of our members figured out as, an, as a teacher in the public school that our elementary age students were not looking forward to Christmas break because many of them were hungry. And this just scandalized her and hurt her. And so she reached out and the church in its very first year created 20 Christmas baskets. 
And it grew from there until last year, we handed out probably 25 days of groceries to 315 families. And as, and, and about three years ago, we maybe five, we'd had one of our elders uh, who really liked to just jump into things. He got us started on having a year round food pantry just for everyone that was there. And because of our location, it made mo the most sense to have the food that we provided be available to people that were in the hotels and on foot, homeless. And so we'd done that. We also served a lot of families that would come in because people would go pick up more stuff. And, and so we were serving in February, probably 95 families that month. And as March turned around, realized that we were going to have to do something different because of COVID. My mm -hmm. secretary and my office of uh, volunteers and staff are wonderful people, and they will not say no to opening a door and helping people, and they will take folks into the pantry with them and have them pick out what they will actually eat. And these are wonderful things unless you're in COVID time. So in order to keep everyone protected, we started having a drive up and we were doing that once and then twice a week. And over time it grew. So we just thought we were gonna serve maybe a hundred families in a month. This last month we served about a thousand families, uh, 600 unique families uh, and we got them so the last time we did this, a week ago last Saturday, we provided about 60 pounds of food to every family of four uh, using the farm to family uh, resources that come from the regional food bank, but then also a lot of other donated and supported items uh, from canned goods. Those boxes are usually 23 pounds mm. and all the way up to uh, extra meat. Depends on what the grocery stores give. Uh, one week we had huge numbers of jalapeno poppers to give to people. <laughs> Some weeks um, uh, people will come in and there'll be cod. Um, the, the most interesting one a couple of weeks ago was uh, all this ground beef that was Wagyu beef. And that's what went out to folks. And so Last time we did this, and we'll do it again this Saturday, we do it on a weekly basis, except for the Saturdays after Thanksgiving and Christmas. We, uh, we ended up sending out over 100 pounds of food with families of five or more. So Tim, where is the food coming from? That's our wonderful partnership with the Concho Valley Regional Food Bank. They are our primary sponsor and donor. They receive all the farm to family boxes that were authorized with the CARES Act. Uh, so we get free milk, free produce, uh, free cheese, free yogurt, and those go out in boxes. But we also get in, um, you know, the, they have donors that don't just give them money or, uh, or those farm to family boxes. They have a truck that goes around to all the big box stores like HEB and Walmart and pick up uh, items that are about to go out of date, but are still fine if you flash freeze them. And so Walmart will flash freeze a whole bunch of meat and send it back with us, uh, back with them, and then they will get it to us. Oh, wow. So is this, um, so I have a couple of questions. Is, is this the only um, effort community-wide that you're aware of? I mean, is this the only like drive up weekly thing that's happening within San Angelo or is that Concho Valley um, food pantry or food bank? Are they um, supplementing others as well? And then do you have partners? I guess those questions kind of go together, but. Oh, yes. Um, so we are the largest food distribution operation in uh, the area, and I, I don't know if that's seven counties or 11, but it's a big area, it's the Concho Valley. And we're the largest one, but we couldn't do this without our partners. Uh, so last time we did the distribution, we had 40 volunteers showed up. 
And most weeks we depend on uh, the Mormon Latter-day Saints missionaries who are stationed and bored as anything in San <laughs> Angelo because they couldn't go to Uruguay and Delhi. Mm. So they come and help us pack boxes, help us distribute. It's really wonderful to have those partnerships. I never imagined we'd be doing partnerships with Mormons. We do it with the Methodist Church. That's more common, and I'm not surprised by that. We value that relationship a great deal, and we have a lot of other donors in the community that help out, and a lot of people that come from churches of Christ, Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, uh, the synagogue. Uh, that come and volunteer and help us. We couldn't do it without them. Wow. Wow. That's, that's awesome. So um, I want to back up just a little bit and, and talk about who are the people that make up St. Paul Presbyterian Church? And are you, are they the same people who helped establish the congregation? Meaning, are they the same kind of people who want their pastor and want as a congregation to push um, themselves and to do those things that um, maybe other congregations wouldn't dream of taking on? Absolutely. It's a very activist congregation, Valerie. And we, we might be at city hall, uh, at city council meetings, telling people that uh, we do need to have more uh, low-income housing in the community, and so we'll advocate for stuff like that. Uh, it's all people that want to push the edges uh, for the most part. And so these are the folks, uh, not just you know writing letters to people or calling people, but actually boots on the ground and then following it up with some advocacy work as well. They are folks that are ready to go out and push the envelope. Uh, we were the first congregation to legally ordain a partnered gay person. Um, we fought all the way to the Permanent Judicial Commission at the General Assembly for that, and mm -hmm. we won a couple months before the entire denomination adopted that as their practice and said it was going to be okay. So we are always out at the edge. Uh, you know, the same folks that brought in the Palmer drug abuse program, it only lasted six or nine months because if you have addicts not doing a, uh, a residential treatment, but in uh, come and go, you're going to have some problems. Mm -hmm. And we did that and it worked great until it didn't. We opened our doors about 20 years ago to homeless people in the community. We had to stop that about four or five years ago because of the damage that was being done to our property. We would love to get back to doing that again because we don't have a shelter here in town, not one. Uh, we have special programs for people that are needing to get out of the cold, but we don't have a homeless shelter. In so, all of San Angelo, there's no all homeless shelter. In San Angelo, no. Wow. We, we had created a compact where we could send people up to Abilene, but their shelter is overflowing. So. Mm -hmm. We're, I'm going to be part of a call on Thursday where we're seeking to figure out how can we fund something? How can we make it happen again? But that's what we do. That's what St. Paul does. We, we have these connections in the community. And because we are known for boots on the ground, doing things, managing the money well, we have huge numbers of donors from outside the congregation that want to support feeding the people that need to be fed during this time. Mm -hmm. So our integrity is huge and really important to us. When we say we're gonna do something with our money or our time, we do it. Wow. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what congregational life in worship looks like right now in the midst of the pandemic and, and maybe even a little bit of um, where you see or how you might be seeing that evolve as, you know, eventually this is going to be over. Right. right. Um, we all hope anyway. So, you know, what, <laughs> what, what um, changes you might see happening? What is, what does that look like for you right now? Well, we are really fortunate to have incredible resources in our congregation. So when we went over to doing things online, we had a professor of theater tech take over the production process for us. 
and we had other people that have great experience with computers. And so we have a very professionally done high quality uh, worship service where we have part of it live and part of it pre-recorded. All the music's pre-recorded and they do that probably twice a month. Right now we are using pre-recorded lighting of the Advent candles so that we could actually be in the sanctuary and record people in the sanctuary where we're not right now, uh, lighting the Advent candle and looking like we're back in church a little bit, reminding people of those moments. So we have wonderful folks that put all that together. They help figure out how do we make music sound good? How can we go from screen to screen? It is, uh, it, it is an amazing production, very, very high quality. Are you still are you still preaching from your office? Oh heck no! I'm not going to preach no? from my office. I preach from right here. Wh- which which is where? Where are you? My house. Oh oh okay. Well, the way you're seated with your books and things, it looks like your office. So okay, so you um, for those who are listening, um, you have a bookshelf behind you with a little beautiful little Tiffany like lamp next to you. Okay, so the ways that I've seen you. Um, on Facebook Live, uh, preaching was yeah, just like that in your robe, sitting and um, very in a very personable way. I I I just love that part. So I love that too. And and the thing that we're, we we want to stay online when we go back in person. I I'd, I'd resisted going online for a long time because I don't want my words preserved for eternity. Uh, because sometimes I. Um, you know, I'll call out someone's name uh, during the sermon. If I see them kind of nodding off and then I'll be like, and so Don, you know, Don's done the following. Or if we're in person, I'll like, you know, actually solicit a response from somebody and um, and people kind of laugh and giggle and hope that they don't get called on. And it's, it's kind of fun. Um, so, you know, we had to get rid of prayer requests which were almost sacramental at our church. I mean, they could go on for five to seven minutes. It was a huge thing. If you got rid of prayer requests or the passing of the peace, you would hear about it. And and you just can't do without that. Now we do all of that in an online Facebook group for prayers for the church because above 98% of our folks are on Facebook or can at least occasionally tap into that, even if they're not regular lurkers. Um, I know I haven't left a lot of space for you to answer the future question yet, and we'll get there. But I, I, I want to tell folks this, and it's not really a story, but the way that St. Paul, and you in particular, invite ruling elders to preach and be a part of the service on a, you know, on a regular basis um, is inspiring too. You share the pulpit in a way that I think is important that helps people like me um, learn, learn that that's okay. Is that an offer to preach for us? (laughs) Anytime, Tim. (laughs) (laughs) So, so let's talk about what does that, you said you were hesitant um, and you, you didn't want to take your worship online. What do you think, what are you beginning to think or learn from uh, the experiences now throughout the last nine months? And and surely there's more to be learned, but um, where are you feeling like that's taking you as a congregation? I think um, I really like the personal connection. I like being this close to the screen, this close to the camera. Uh, I usually have my gallery view set up on Sunday morning so that I can see people's faces when they turn their cameras on. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful because we'll have people from Virginia to Colorado. Um, My parents have become extremely uh, weekly normal participants in the congregation and they're in Michigan. And so we're able to reach out to people well beyond where we've been using Zoom. And we have a lot of people that also like to join us on Facebook Live, but I think that the Zoom has been wonderful and I'm gonna miss that if we can't figure out another way to do that because I like seeing the people that are watching mm-hmm. um, and, and really pull them in and draw them in. And I don't know how to do that without having 
50 TV screens set up in front of the front pew with everyone's faces on them. So we'll have to figure out how that works. But it's, um, I, I think that having this level of intimacy and connection with people is really important. I hope you've been enjoying this episode of Sunspots. Most of us, especially in these times, need to hear more about the work of the spirit, places where the energy has caused a solar flare and made big impact. It could be in your local congregation, presbytery, or any ministry context. Send that good news and ministry ideas to the Synod at sunspots at synodsun.org. Now, back to the show. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, we've talked a little bit in the past about, um, about failure mm-hmm. and, uh, or redirection, right? How does, how does the spirit use what we might call failure as a redirection? So I'm wondering in, in your almost 13 years now at uh, St. Paul and the involvement of all of the uh, missions of the congregation and the community, mm-hmm. where have you seen um, some failures or opportunity for redirection by the Holy Spirit? And, and what has that looked like? I think that... I think, I think having to give up our homeless apartment was one of the things that hurt the most. Um, we'd had that for about 15 years when we gave up on that at the time. And we had a leak in the basement and all the floors had to come out. So there was a natural moment when that happened. But trying to figure out how do we do that? Because we tried 20 years ago to get the other churches in town to participate in Family Promise. And each of them take a week to host homeless families. Midland does it, Austin does it, um, all over the nation. People yeah, do. oh yeah, I know a lot of them that do. Absolutely, and in our community of probably 300 churches, only four were willing to open their doors. So our session said the heck with it. We're just going to take one of our unused Sunday school rooms in the gym and put people in there. And so we did that. And we've had some wonderful successes. Um, Our very first resident, uh, she and her wife are raising five kids. Uh, I did their wedding a couple years ago on Valentine's Day after worship. Um, They're still on the edges of the church, somewhat involved. We've seen some successes like that. We ended up also having, you know, someone who was doing prostitution in order to get more money and her underwear showed up in the kid's Sunday school classroom. That wasn't okay. Um, We've had, um, you know, we had family violence that happened because guess what happens when you're dealing with a homeless family? There's stressors. And I was actually surprised it took us 15 years to get to the point of having a domestic dispute. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had to evict someone out of there. The, the husband, not the wife and children, but the husband had to go. And the wife has now moved back to her hometown and uh, has her own house and her own life. And um, the, the former husband's no longer a part of it. And they're all safe and doing reasonably well close to family. The, The thing that happens when you work with homeless people is you're going to end up with rough edges. You're gonna end up, if you house it, with the possibility that drugs may be sold on your property, that prostitution may happen. Um, We had one guy that had medical problems and he almost bled out because in our basement, uh, the nursery that my kids first went into Uh, when we got there, had been converted into the apartment uh, for people at the church. And in this place, um, he almost bled out because he had a peg tube in his stomach, and the public medical uh, work will 
will put a peg tube in because it's an emergency, but they won't take one out. And peg tubes need to be handled and they need to come out. But if you're homeless and poor, you're not gonna be able to have it come out. Mm -hmm. It's, you're gonna have these problems. And, and so it was a failure in that we had to shut it down because we had reached our level of risk tolerance. Uh, with the last couple, um, some violence and some more drastic things that had happened. But we're back again trying to figure out how do we do this as a community? Mm -hmm. Because we don't have a way to do this. We've had, I think, two homeless people drown this year on the Concho River because that's the primary place where you can squat if you're homeless. You set up camp right down by the Concho River. And if you want to bathe, you go into the water and you bathe. Um, mm -hmm you wash your clothes there, we need to do better. And so we're gonna be working hard to see how we can do better as a community. Awesome. I applaud all of those efforts. Maybe um, more than your listeners wanted to know. <laughs> well, you know, this is all about, for me anyway, this is all about, yes, highlighting um, important mission and ministry that's happening in congregations, but also about learning from each other um, and ways that uh, churches, ways that congregations and their leadership have taken those, you know, Holy Spirit redirects and, and figured out what the next step is and never completely disengaging, but finding different points to re-enter, like the homeless situation you described, different places to re-enter mission that can um that can be even that much more effective so i hope that we're learning from each other absolutely and i think um one of the things we we joked about you know we are open to the community so much back before covid we had our building open so much to the public that we would say that's why we can't have nice things because we don't want to have anything so nice that if it goes missing it's going to create a huge problem in our congregation because mm -hmm. we believe in being open to the community. And that's part of our core values is we won't buy stuff and have it around and make it an idol of some sort. We have a very plain sanctuary with um, a concrete block on the walls and it is an actual canvas for liturgical arts so we've done mm -hmm. things with shadows and with tapestries and and with uh, cutouts there was one year where we had um uh, moving to bethlehem and all along the wall were these uh shadows of people moving towards bethlehem and we started off with some generic ones and each week we added some people from the congregation where we actually lit them and cut out around them and put them up on the wall. And it was kind of fun seeing people appear. So prioritizing feeding and helping people means that we don't have super expensive stuff in our sanctuary, but it doesn't mean we can't do amazing things. Uh, God provides a way, just like, you know, we've got usually less than a hundred people in worship on Sunday when we're in person, but God is providing all sorts of volunteers that come in and help out, even if they're not members of the congregation. And no one should ever be afraid to try something. I've got pastors who are members of much larger churches here that are really, they've about had it with their churches because their churches won't try big things to help people. And here we are, a medium small congregation, and we're feeding over 1% of the city every single week. It's a city of 100,000. Do you, I, and this may or may not be a fair question, I'm, I'm not really sure, but do you think that, that the difference is, is the startup of the congregation at St. Paul was very purposefully missional, very purposefully out in the community pushing those edges um, and that's, I can't speak obviously for every other congregation within the synod, but I, I, 
my impression is that that's not necessarily been the um, the ethos in most other congregations. Um, and I'm just going to wonder out loud: Is it possible for for a congregation who wasn't purposefully built that way to to change that, to to turn that ethos on its on its head, so to speak, and say this our time together, even if we're not together, our physically, our time as a congregation is for purposes of benefiting the community. Um, you know, not just our inside the four walls community, but the larger community um, and being Christ-like to the world. Um, so I wonder out loud if that's, if that's possible. I think it is because it's in the DNA of all human beings and it's in the DNA of all Christian churches, Valerie. It is so important to be out there. And, and the mistake that we make over and over and over again is this scarcity mentality, right? Mm -hmm. It is thinking that if we try to do something risky and it fails, we are going to be failures and the church might fail. The church might fold. Um, you know, we have, this fear that uh, if, and I don't think this congregation has ever had this fear of, you know, if we bring in new people, try new ways of doing things, that uh, that will be a danger to us. But it's also, our, our congregation has the benefit, we've, we've been in our building now for 50 years as of last year. That was our 50th anniversary. That's our fifth or sixth building that we've been in. This is the longest time we've ever been in a space. And people have some memory of that. This is definitely the best space. I wouldn't want us to move. We've also had four different names over the course of our life as a congregation. And so we're not afraid of change. We're not afraid of risk. But I think that recasting this to understand that we're not just trying a human enterprise. This is not rotary. This is the church of Jesus Christ engaged in ministry on God's behalf, and God provides. Mm. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be provided to you, right? So if you go out and you're doing your best, even if you fall on your face, that's okay. You can get back up and you can try again. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. So, um... Just a couple of other questions for you. First, what would, for, the, for our listeners, for people who might be watching on YouTube, whatever, what do you want people to do as a result of hearing this podcast, as a result of hearing the story of St. Paul Presbyterian Church? What kind, what kind of call to action would you like us um, to give to folks who are listening to us? Well, one thing I didn't talk about earlier was why we're still online. We're one of the very few churches in our community that hasn't gone back to in-person. You know, we've had really? several churches that have gone back and forth, but we actually have medical professionals on our task force. And we have an attorney and we have, we have people with expertise that have been able to see all the things that are going on. And I know a lot of churches have gone around with this fear that if they're not in person, they're not A, a real church, or B, they're going to lose people. And we have kept very consistent with our people that are engaged this entire time. We're doing what we understand to be right because we are trying to slow the spread of COVID and protect all the people in our community. And that's hard. People are tired with it. It's hard navigating technology, but we're doing this and God has provided us all the resources and people still stay engaged. And I'm convinced the good portion of that is not just because we have professional level people running our uh, church services, but because they know that we are engaged in real ministry in the community. And Jesus says, by their fruits, you shall know them, right? Mm -hmm. And so it gives a credibility to what we do. So I, I want to tell people, don't be afraid to do what's right, even if other people are telling you it's wrong or it's dangerous or it's too risky. 
it's okay. And, and, and I'm not saying every church needs to be online only. Uh, every congregation has to make that decision for themselves. But I am saying don't make those decisions out of fear. And the other part is don't think too small. You know, <laughs> if, if, if we said we have 230 members in the church and there's no way we can feed uh, 300 families each and every week, we would have failed before we started. But we kept growing. We kept growing in faith. We kept modifying. We're also not addicted to staying with the way everything's always been. And so we have adapted what we have done to feed people a great deal over the last, what are we at, eight months, nine months? Nine months. And, and it's gone really well. And there have been times where we felt like we were getting overwhelmed, but we went back to the drawing board. We tried again. And this last time when we thought we'd bitten off more than we could chew, God provided 20 Mormon missionaries. Wow. You know, it, as Presbyterians, we don't consider, we consider Mormons can be very good people. I have members of my family that are Mormon, but we don't even consider them Christian. If you're baptized in a Mormon church, you have to be baptized because you haven't been baptized when you come into the Presbyterian church. But God provided those partners in the same way God has had us in partnership with the synagogue, uh, as well as other Christians that have come from across town. But God is active out there, even outside the places where we think God is. Hmm. And, and God will provide. And I, it's interesting that you, you talk so much about those partnerships and, and that they look so much different from what you would have imagined. Right. I think, um, at least for, you know, as a, as, um, as a witness to many of the congregations, um, I, I noticed that we individual congregations have a, um, a lot of times there's a hesitancy to partner with anyone. And, um, I, I wonder if that's what that's about. Um, it seems almost as though there's like a, uh, almost a competitive nature to the mission and ministry. And I don't know if you're a student of the Enneagram or, uh, you know, if you, if you know about that, but, but Richard Rohr says that, that the, the United States is a, is an Enneagram three. We, uh, as a culture, we are the performer, right? We are the achiever. And I wonder if, if that is like the makeup of, some of the congregations that have that tendency to, or that hesitancy to partner or even share with other congregations how they did something that, you know, that worked in their community. Oftentimes we don't want to share those stories. We want to share the success story, but the failure and the, the uh, Holy Spirit redirects that got us there um, to, to being places of true service in our community. Those tend to be things that, we want to keep to ourselves. And I think that is really, really unfortunate. Um, so I, it's really good to hear you talk about those partnerships. I think it goes back to that sense of scarcity. That's what I noticed when we first moved here was that the nonprofits wouldn't work together because there were scarce resources. They were all afraid of losing donors to another organization. Churches were afraid of losing members to another church. And so they stayed in their boxes, but our church has always been pushing that open. And so we've had, this is our first year in about 30 years where we have not had San Angelo living together, which is a, uh, a wonderful, my wife would say it's a talent show. It's a worship service that happens at the beginning of Advent each year where people share uh, the gifts that their churches bring in worshiping. And it was especially important, um, started up about 25, 30 years ago, when tensions were very high between the black community and the white community here in town. Because like every place in Texas, we have a history of racism. Mm. Uh, now, San Angelo's, I, I'm going to contend in many ways, has done better than most. Uh, they, the, the high school that my kids have gone to was 
built and became integrated a couple years before Brown versus Board of Education. And so they were, they said, there's no point. It, it was West Texas pragmatism, right? Um, there's no point in spending extra money. We can see where this is all going. So we're just going to integrate now because it's going to save us money in the long run. Mm. Very, very West Texas pragmatist. What I've seen during this time period has been a willingness of more folks to cooperate. And maybe that's self-selecting. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to put that out, that the people that I'm finding that are more willing to co cooperate are the people that I'm dealing with. And so I'm not dealing with the people that are kind of insular and pulling back. Mm. Uh, but we've been partnering with, um, you know, legal aid comes out and passes out stuff to some of our folks to help them manage evictions and to avoid evictions. We've had people come out from the community action agency and pass out pamphlets to help people know how to pay their utility bills. Um, we, we just go out and we partner like that. And I see people more willing to make those partnerships than I have in a long time. And maybe that's just my circle of acquaintances, but it brings me hope because mm -hmm. There is enough mission and ministry for all of us to do out there. We are not in danger of putting one another out of the business of helping the world. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. So true. And, uh, and there is a lot of hope mm -hmm. right now, even, even now there's a lot of hope. And as you, as you talk about the, um, the decisions that you've made to, to stay worshiping online and not go back to worshiping in person um, gives me hope. And I, I wanna make sure that people who are watching or listening now understand that today is December the 1st of 2020, um, just so that they can put in context um, that piece of the conversation because um, it might've been different uh, you know, a month or two ago, um, and it, and hopefully God willing, um, it will be different two or three months from now. So, absolutely. so one, Tim, one, of the, one of the things that we've had the most fun with in our weekly worship has been the passing of the peace. So that's almost sacramental in our congregation. You try to stop it. You know, I, I almost have to blow a whistle every week, <laughs> uh, when we've done the prayer of confession, passing of the peace, and then it's time to start the children's sermon. So it's, it, it's a wonderful thing, but we can't see each other. We ask people to turn on their cameras, mm -hmm. make a peace sign, do stuff like that. But another part that we've been doing is going around to folks and I'll go up to people uh, where I see them, if I meet them at the store or at their home or at the church and take a video of them saying, hi, this is Rose. I'm still working in the garden. Uh, I miss seeing all of you and peace be with you. And just that little 10 second clip makes people feel more connected. And it's, it's really wonderful to see. That's awesome. That's totally awesome. Um, so Tim, last question. What, if anything, do you wish I had asked you about, but didn't? Well, seeing as I redirected a couple of those last questions, I think I got <laughs> everything in that I wanted to get in. I may not have answered all your questions, but mm -hmm. I made sure to cover all the things I wanted to get covered. Okay. Fabulous. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being with me today, Tim. Um, I hope that soon um, a bunch of episodes are going to drop for the first time. We're hoping it'll be next week. It might be week after sometime during Advent um, so that folks can binge. I hope you and everyone listening will subscribe to Sunspots. And um, I think that, you and the folks of St. Paul will hear some other very encouraging stories of mission and maybe even in one of the upcoming episodes, find other places to partner um, from across the Synod. And I'll leave it at that and we'll have a private conversation in a minute. Okay. That's Thank awesome. you so much, Tim. Thank you, Valerie. It's been an honor. In the Senate of the Sun, we believe we work together across boundaries. We make visible the good news and find wholeness in the body of Christ. In our common calling, we impact lives together. So let's remember to connect with, equip, and empower one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Today, 
and every day.